Welcome to the South End Church of Christ. My name is Kyle Langford. I'm the evangelist. We're located at 4001 Taylor Boulevard, 40215, which is in Louisville, Kentucky. We worship every Sunday at 2.30. And during the summer, we have midweek Bible classes at Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, you'd be a welcome guest, and we'd be honored to have you. If you're watching this on our YouTube or our Facebook, we'd also appreciate any comments or questions or sharing or liking the video. Uh, if you have additional questions, you may email them to uh, the South End Church of Christ at southendchristians at gmail.com. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Uh, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A very common passage, one that's often uh, quoted, but quoted incorrectly uh, with improper context and meaning. So there's a lot of individuals that use this verse as a proof text, but yet have some serious misunderstandings about what it means. So we're going to talk about that today. My lesson today is an expository look on faith, uh, specifically using James chapter 1 and chapter 2 which is going to be the bulk of uh, the reading today and, and the exegesis of passage. But we're going to have a few other passages in context and to make some uh, definitions and, and point out uh, what we're talking about. This uh, sermon was originally preached on the 16th of July, 2023, and is being re-recorded on 7-22-2023. Faith being often misunderstood is something that people uh, claim uh, to have saved them. And then, of course, they're saved by grace. Uh, the passage that we're talking about in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, verses 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Now, as we can see, uh, faith is essential, and it's required for salvation. But it says we're also saved by grace. Defining grace... Grace, uh, it comes from the Strong's uh, 5485. Uh, C-H-A-R-I-S is the, is the Greek word. And the definition is kindness, our gift, our blessing, uh, brought to man by Jesus Christ, or what most people would oftentimes refer to as uh, unmerited favor. Uh, it's something that we receive that we have not earned. Uh, grace was oftentimes misunderstood, and if you can read about it later in Romans chapter 3, many individuals saw it as, as a gift that they would earn while sinning. So many would try to continue in sin that they may get more and more grace, that they would have more grace after uh, their life in heaven. And of course, that wasn't uh, at all what was implied by that, but grace was simply pain the debt of sin that man had occurred. But that doesn't mean that we should run up a debt. Additionally, uh, let, let's define some additional words here. Works, not of works. This comes from the Greek word ergon, uh, which is from the Strong's 2041. The definition is to work. And its usage is to work or a task, employment, a deed or action, uh, something that is wrought or made or a work. Now, uh, this word work also implies something uh, that a worker has accomplished. So the worker has accomplished something in and of themselves. So again, not of works. We've been saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, not of our own work, not of our own accomplishment, we have not been saved, but instead it is a gift, a gift of God, one that we cannot earn. But then it goes on to say that we are his workmanship. And again, this workmanship uh, comes from the Strong's 4161, uh, Pomea, P-O-I-E-M-A, uh, which is that which has been made, our work of God as the creator. This word is only used twice in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1 here, and also in Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For since by the creation of the world, 
His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. That phrase, the things that are made, is uh, translated from this word that we get, workmanship. So again, this is something that God has created, and we are created, uh, again, we are his workmanship, just like the, the sun has its role in the universe, and uh, plants have their role on the earth, and animals have their role, and everything uh, follows according to what they have been made to be. Uh, they, they follow the laws which God has given to govern them. And so do we, or so we should, uh, because we are his workmanship. Additionally, defining of terms. Oftentimes when people use uh, faith, they use it uh, synonymously with belief, and they'll use belief and faith interchangeably. However, that's not uh, biblically correct, and it's in the Greek language, the Kone Greek language is very specific. Uh, it's so specific that you had uh, multiple different words for love. You had agape love, you had philippe love, uh, you had uh, eros love. Uh, you had all these other different types of words to describe one thing that oftentimes is translated into love. And again, the Greek uh, is very specific in its defining terms uh, between belief and faith. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. This, this Greek word victory is translated Nike, uh, or is the Greek word Nike, uh, that has overcome the world, our faith. Uh, who, is, who is he who overcomes the world, but he, he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, when we're reading the word here, believes or belief, this comes from the word uh, pistio, uh, Strong's 4100, which means to believe or to entrust. Uh, its usage is I believe or have faith in, trust in, uh, or I'm entrusted with. Now, this is used of persuading oneself. Uh, it comes from a human source. Uh, now, it is intended to be combined with uh, that of faith, which is from a godly source. That is the persuasion of God. Faith uh, that you can read about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, there is one faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Also, Ephesians chapter 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Again, there is no additional faiths coming. The faith has been once for all delivered. And again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith, uh, as we can see here, is God's persuasion for man. It comes from a godly source. Again, it can be trusted because of the source, because God cannot lie. So our belief lines up with and matches the faith that is persuading us. So the things that we see, like Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for example, the things that we see that were clearly made that are good uh, point to the existence of a God. And again, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel, the good news, the message which God has revealed to man is the power of God. That is the power of God and the salvation. 
and we should believe it. And in so doing, we can have salvation. Now in John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45, let's see this faith put into practice, how God persuades man. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is Jesus Christ speaking. And I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Again, this is how faith works. No one can come to the Father. No one can come to the Son unless they are drawn, unless they are uh, being given a persuasion to do so, unless they are given faith. He goes on uh, later in the book of John, John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And again, I'll stop here for a second and point out additionally that there are some individuals that believe that I should only read the words in red, that I should only read the words which Jesus said. But again, Jesus himself says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And he goes on and says, however, when he, that is the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is one of the Godhead, uh, given a, uh, the, the, you, the use of a personhood by denoting him as a he, is going to guide us into all truth. It says, for when he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, that is Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. These are the things which Jesus said, I have many more things to tell you, but you can't bear it. He will declare it to you, and all things that the, that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So again, the Father is going to draw you to the Son, is going to draw you to himself through the faith which was once for all delivered. Again, that common implement, that common thing that all people that obtain salvation have, the faith, as you can read in Jude verse 3. Now, faith is reaching out from God to us. What is it reaching out to? It's reaching out to our belief. It's reaching out to our uh, ability and intellect to be able to understand the world around us and to understand its relationship to God's word and determine it to be true and to accept it. Now, Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, talks about uh, the joining of our belief in God's faith. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So again, this faith that we have, we can only have that if we hear the gospel, if we hear the word of God. And that word of God is delivered to us through preaching and teaching, through the word. Now this faith that comes into us by nature will grow or should grow if we allow it to grow, if we continue in the faith. And if we do continue in the faith, that faith will and must be tested. Now, this is where we get into James chapter 1 and James chapter 2. Uh, for the next good bit, we'll be in those chapters. So in James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, my brethren. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that your testing of your faith produces patience. Some translations uh, translate that into endurance. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. 
But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. So we see that the practice of using and utilizing and growing in our faith, the application of our faith, will be tried. It will uh, be tested. And in so doing, we will develop endurance. I'm an exercise science major, and my minor is uh, nutrition. And again, the same principles are applied into exercise. When you first start a new exercise, it is incredibly difficult, and you'll be weak, and you won't have very much endurance. But if you continue in that exercise, if you continue to progress in that exercise through progressive overload by increasing the weight or having more time under tension, or by uh, to develop endurance, uh, increasing the amount of repetitions that you do if you're going to do uh, lifting uh, physical exercise or, or increasing the number of sets that you do. Or if you're going to do cardio, uh, then increasing the distance that you run or increasing uh, the time that you run, increasing the number of sprints that you do if you're going to do circuits. All of these things our bodies are going to adapt to. Uh, the stressors that we put our body under, under load, our body will have physiological responses to, and it will cause the growth of uh, new uh, muscle through hypertrophy. It will increase the occurrence of uh, type uh, two muscle fibers uh, in our legs if we do sprint drills. And by doing so, it also increases our endurance, increases our, our lung and our heart capacity to be able to transport blood and oxygen throughout the body. And again, everything that we do, uh, let, verse 6, let him ask in faith without doubting. So the things that we do, the things that we pray for, we should do in faith. And that's, again, faith revealed from God. So we should do everything according to God's will, which is his word delivered to man. Everything according to his will, not our will. And if we do that, then we should absolutely believe that the things we're doing will be rewarded and will happen. But if we don't do them in faith, if we don't ask in faith, if we, if we ask amiss, then of course, why should we have any belief that those things will come about? Now in James chapter 1 verses 9 through 15, it says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Again, talking about this endurance. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. We see here that faith put through trials when it is tested and it produces endurance through those trials, those individuals will receive the crown of life. Which again shows us that a faith that is not working, that is not being strengthened, that is not being tested, uh, is not the type of faith that will uh, bring the crown of life. Verse 16 through 21, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, just like the faith that is delivered and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Going back to, again, Jesus said, everyone that comes to the father must be drawn by the father. And Jesus Christ said he would send the comforter. He would spend, send the spirit of truth that would uh, lead men into all truth. This is how he brings us forth. 
that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Again, this is how he brought us forth. This is how he draws us near to him, by delivering to us his good gift of faith, where he sends it to us, and if we receive it, and if we allow the word to be implanted into us, and we allow it to grow, it will be a saving faith. It will be able to save our souls. And in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, this tells us that we have a choice, that we have a choice whether or not we allow the faith in, where we, whether or not we allow the faith to grow. But be, uh, verse 22, but be doers of the word, the same word which was revealed to you, which he's using to draw to you. It's telling us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So we see here again, when the word is delivered to us, we must be doers of the word not just hearers. When we hear it and we allow it to be implanted in it, in us, we must allow the faith to bring about changes in us. And if we do, if we're a doer of the work, then this one will be blessed in what he does. We cannot hold back the faith. This transitions to James chapter 2. In James chapter 2 verses 1 through 7, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there or, you, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme you, your, that noble name by which you were called? And we see here that, that these uh, Christians that James is writing to in the first century, they're not abiding in the perfect law of liberty. They're not allowing the faith to change them. They're holding it back. They're not doing the works that they're called to do. One of the ways that they're holding back is they're showing partiality. They're treating uh, wealthy Christians better than those that are impoverished. This is not what you're supposed to do. We're to treat each person uh, as equal in the kingdom of God, not uh, have hierarchies. And again, there's other ways that you can do this too in holding back the faith and not revealing your faith to those around about you and saying, well, this person's not uh, going to be interested in the faith. This person has no interest in hearing about uh, Jesus Christ or the gospel. Or if I, if I say this message uh, from the Lord to this individual, they might uh, respond back negatively. They might rebuke me or they might not be my friend anymore. And so in a lot of ways, people hold back the faith daily and they don't talk about their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They don't talk about the word. They don't talk about the things that the people need to hear to even have faith. And so they hold the gospel back from those round about them and they don't share the gospel, which is the good news, which is the power into God into salvation. And again, we do that with partiality. But again, we're reminded that oftentimes those that we would see as downtrodden, those that are considered as less than in our society, those that are impoverished, 
those are the individuals that are oftentimes most likely to be receptive to hearing the gospel, to hear the good news, to hear the message that there is a redeeming God out there that loves them and that will forgive them of their sin and will be there to help them in their time of need. Now, in James chapter 2, verses 8 through 17, we see here in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, and again, the scriptures are the faith which was delivered to the saints, then it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, again, what we just talked about, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and do this and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which you are, are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus by Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is death, dead. So we can see here that if you allow faith in, if you're fully persuaded in it, you believe it, and you're going to accept it and receive it and allow it to do its work, this faith will cause in you to be Christ-like. It will cause you to be a Christian. You'll start acting like Christ. And in so doing, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You will not show partiality. But instead, you will be uh, willing and wanting to extend grace to everyone that you meet. And in so doing, you want to extend that perfect gift, which is the word of God, which is the faith that is able to draw people unto our Father. And again, it says here, real quickly, to point out... In, kind of something that might seem odd, especially in our society, where it says, uh, verse 11, for it says, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. And again, we need to be very particular uh, uh, or specific, I should say, in counting that sin is sin. And we don't need to be uh, judging one another uh, for one sin that we've committed as a lesser sin than some other sin that someone else has committed. We oftentimes get this kind of um, skewed or, or misunderstanding in how uh, our nations judge criminal laws. But again, if somebody commits adultery or if somebody commits a murder, that's not to say that they won't have to suffer the punishment of the local law. Uh, but we should be willing to extend to them the gospel, which is able to cause them to repent and to get forgiveness of their sin. Regardless of whatever the sin it is, they can get forgiveness. But then it goes on to say, uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. So we should be willing to extend mercy to everyone that has sinned. Because again, we have sinned ourselves. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But now it says, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? Which is a legitimate question because it says, uh, it goes on to say, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And it gives the example. It says we have a brother, that it, or sister, that is naked and destitute of daily food, that they need food to live, otherwise they'll perish. And one says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed by the body. What does it profit? So again, it's saying that if we do not uh, extend our faith into a practice of works to be Christ-like, then our faith is dead. Uh, and so in order for our faith to be living, it has to have works. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 25, uh, where he said, he answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. 
So we see that when we do the works of Christ, that they're bearing witness of our faith. They're bearing witness in our Christ-like behavior, and they're pointing to Jesus Christ. Now in James chapter 2, verses 18 through 26, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he, was offered, when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see then that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. Uh, verse 23, And the scripture was filled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without works is dead also. So we see that faith was working together with his works, Abraham's works. And by those two, they were made perfect. By those trials and the temptations that he went through, he was able to develop endurance and patience. And he was able to be made, uh, make his faith perfected through God. Uh, and it says that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And again, if you were going to look and to see wherever uh, in the scriptures that these two words are used together, faith and only, you're going to find that only here in James chapter 2, verse 24, where we see faith only used together. And we see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, in Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 16, uh, we see faith in practice on an individual uh, level. Now, Jesus said, uh, later he rebuked to the leaven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Again, these are people that profess that they saw the Christ risen, and yet they did not believe the gospel, the good news. And when they did not believe their testimony that Christ was risen, he rebuked their unbelief, their lack of belief, and their hardness of heart. In verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, again, remember, belief and faith are two different things. Belief is what we do reaching out to God. Faith is what he does reaching out to us to persuade us. And he does this through his word, through his gospel. And when we preach the gospel, like Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. When we believe the gospel, that will cause us to do some things. It will cause us to work. It, the works of God will start happening in us and we will change. But we will also, through our belief, do the works of God. One of which we see here is being baptized. And it says, if our belief in the gospel uh, corresponds with our obedience in baptism, then we will be saved. But if we do not believe, if we do not believe the gospel that was sent to us, well, then there is no salvation. Without our belief, we cannot have salvation. And again, we see that in John chapter 6, verses 28 through 29, uh, they asked Jesus, they said unto him, What shall we do that we may do the work uh, uh, of the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Now again, that we may work is Ergo maya, uh, maya uh, which is a derivative, which is a word of origin from the work ergon, which is work. Again, this work 
ergon uh, is to work or to labor. And this other work, which is this a derivative word, uh, ergozama, is to work with patience or to produce. So again, we see that they ask Jesus, what shall they do that they may work the works of God? They wanted to do the works of God so they could be pleasing to God. And then Jesus said to them, this is the ergon, the work that you must do. You must believe this pistio. You must believe, you must be convinced in your own mind in him whom he sent. Back to our original text in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace, that is, unmerited favor that we did not earn, you have been saved or redeemed, you have been purchased through faith. This faith is the good gift of God that comes down from God. There's only one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It was once for all delivered. There's never any more faiths going to be uh, revealed. And we must have this faith in order to be uh, in, in order to be pleasing to God. This faith is delivered to man through his word, uh, which God sent uh, his son in the form of the flesh, where the word became flesh. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the comforter, which would guide us into all truth, the spirit of truth, which is again what God is using to draw us unto him. This is the faith, and not of ourselves. We didn't create this. I didn't write the scriptures. Uh, it was divinely inspired. It was God-breathed. God delivered it, not ourselves. It is the gift of God, which goes back to the grace. This is something that God gave mankind. He did not have to give it, but he did. He had a plan to redeem mankind from the very beginning. When Adam and Eve sinned and was cast out of the garden, he had a plan. This was the gift of God, that he was going to redeem his creation. In verse 9, not of works, not our works, that is, because again, not of ourselves, in verse 8, not of our works, lest anyone should boast. Because again, this is something that we cannot earn. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. None of us, save Christ, have lived a perfect life. So we have not earned salvation. Only Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has earned his rightful place in heaven. Uh, he was God. He came here in the flesh, and he lived a perfect life as a man. And in doing so, he offered his life, laid it down, that he could pay our price and redeem us unto his father. Verse 10, for again, we are his workmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Both originally from the beginning, we were created, and when we were created, it was good. We were created to do the works of God, but we fell, and we needed a law. We needed to be taught right and wrong, good and evil, and we were unable to live up to that. So again, Christ comes here, and he delivers unto us the gospel, and he redeems us, and he makes us children in him. He, we're born again through him in John chapter 3. And in so, he has prepared us to be uh, for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now that's faith individual, but then there's also a collective faith. This faith that you find collective is in the local body, uh, which is called the ecclesia or the congregation, and that is the church. And a church also has to be alive in the faith. It has to do works according to the faith, not according to their own uh, devices, but according to what was revealed. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but they are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, 
that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And again, we see just like with the individual, uh, where we know our faith by our works, uh, so do we do collectively as a church. And uh, Jesus is telling them here, I know your works. I know they're being tested. I know that you're facing trials and tribulation. And in doing so, those, are, those uh, works through your faith are being strengthened. You're gaining endurance and patience. And also, it says, I know your poverty. These individuals uh, were physically impoverished. And we're also to told that uh, oftentimes those that are impoverished or considered less than in the world are more likely to accept the faith of God. And in so, they are very rich in the faith. In their, uh, in, in their tribulation, we see in verse 10, they're going to be tested. But in this tribulation, they're told and exhorted to be faithful unto death. And if they are faithful, that means they're continuing to work and labor unto death, then they will receive the crown of life. Again, they cannot depart from the faith. They cannot give up the faith. They cannot stop working in the faith. They can't just you know, pick up and do something of their own will. It has to be of the faith uh, in order for it to be pleasing to God. And if they continue in that, then they will receive the crown of life. Contrast that to uh, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And again, knowing the faith by works. These individuals had a name, uh, but their works did not live up to their name. Their works did not live up to their faith. And in so, they were dead. They have not been found perfect uh, before God. And so, this church is being exhorted that they have to uh, sh be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. They have to rekindle their faith, and they have to be busy doing the work of God if they want to be pleasing. Otherwise, the candlestick will be removed, and they will be dead. So again, thank you very much for sticking with us through this entire lesson on faith. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you'd be our friend uh, to send these an email or, or put them in the text box or the comment section. Uh, you could reach out to me and I would be happy to answer those questions. If you have any disagreements, I'd also be happy to talk about our disagreements so that we might come together over the faith and determine what God's will is on the subject matter. And again, I hope that this has been encouraging and strengthening of your faith. And if it is, then that strengthening of your faith will cause you to go about doing the work of God, to be more Christ-like. Now, if you have heard this for the first time, uh, of the gospel, the plan of salvation, about things like hearing the word of God, believing the word of God, repenting of your sins, uh, like you can read about in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as you can read about in Acts, or excuse me, Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch, as he was being preached Jesus unto by uh, Philip the Evangelist. And that's all we know that he preached. He preached Jesus, the same message that Jesus commanded his followers to preach in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, where they were commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And just like you can read about in Mark 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized, the Ethiopian heard Jesus preached, and then coming along a large amount of water, he said, See, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said to him, Nothing. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you can be baptized. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they immediately went down into the water and he was baptized, and he came up out of the water rejoicing, and Philip was caught away. And the reason why he was rejoicing is because, as you can see in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, or Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 
uh, or Matthew chapter 28 or Acts chapter 8 or Acts chapter 22, many other passages, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21, that baptism is used to wash away our sins, to put us in contact with the blood, as you can read about in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, it is the circumcision, not with our hands, but of Christ's hands. And it unites us with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, as you can read about in Romans chapter 6. And in so doing, when you come up out of that water baptism, you too have put the old man of sin and death on the cross. You have crucified them. You had buried them. You had put them to death. And you come up a new creation, as you can read about in Romans chapter 3, born again as a child of God. And if you are, well, then you'll continue to go on to live in faith and grow in faith. And in doing uh, a life of faith, you will do greater and greater works in the name of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, people will see those works and they will see that they're not your works, but they're the works of Christ. And that will point to Christ and his father. And they will ask you about why you're living your life the way that you are, why you have faith. Uh, and then you will use the faith. You will deliver it to them because Romans chapter 1 verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who hears it. And you will share it with them. And they too will mingle their belief with the faith that is being delivered. And they too can become a child of God. If you have the first time you've heard this and you need to obey the gospel and become a child of God, if you would please reach out to me so that we can uh, meet up in the Louisville area or I can find a local congregation, a local ecclesia, a church that I can uh, put you in contact with that you can immediately obey the gospel this very hour and call upon the name of the Lord and wash away your stripes as you can read about in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And you can become a child of God and you can have that hope of salvation uh, that, that you didn't earn. You did a work of God, not your own works, but it is freely given uh, unmerited favor, as you can read about in Ephesians chapter 2. And that faith is what is saving faith. So again, I hope this has been beneficial to you. And if you are a member of a congregation and you find that you're not doing things uh, according to the faith, you look around and you see that your congregation isn't doing the work of evangelism, isn't doing the work of edification or benevolence, that it is not busy about preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel with the lost in this world, then maybe you need to edify and encourage them as well to get about doing the work of the Lord. Uh, so you can uh, prove yourself through your works that you are worthy to wear the name, that you are alive in the faith, and so that you can grow. Whatever your question may be, you would be my dear friend if you'd reach out to me. And with this, I wish you a blessed day and, and hope that uh, this message continues to work in you and edify you and encourage you in the faith. Uh, and if so, you are my dear brother and sister in Christ. God bless you and go with God.